Hi, it's Weston I, and today we are reviewing my baguette. Mm -mm. Get out. What? No, no, get out. Get out. Ow. Hi, this is Chance Olufsen, and this is my video. Let's talk about a red. So about four months ago, we made a video unboxing the Red Scarlet X Dragon. And in that video, we said that we would be bringing test footage soon to show you guys. Well, obviously we didn't deliver on that promise very quickly, uh, but we are here now with a new camera and new test footage to try to rectify things. So yep. let's get into it. Yep. Old camera's gone. New camera's here. And it's beautiful. Mm hmm All right, so you may be wondering why we got a different camera when it has the same 6K Dragon sensor in it. Uh, well, this one has carbon fiber, so that's why it's worth uh, like twice as much. You mean there's more features than just carbon fiber? Just a, just a little bit, so. The, uh, the first camera that we bought, um, we bought it used. I mean, we bought this one used as well, but you know, the price tag was the big feature for us that you know made it possible. And so when we got that camera, it was the 6K Dragon sensor, which is the exact same sensor in this camera. Um, however, it was the older DSMC-1. And there were a few problems with that that we didn't really think would be an issue when we first bought it. Um, the biggest being that you can only shoot in 5K. And with reds, they actually window the sensor and, and crop in as you drop your resolution. So that um, made noise more prevalent and it just, you know, the image did not look very nice in that situation because the Scarlet X Dragon can only shoot up to 12 frames per second in full frame 6K, which is a problem when you're trying to shoot real time video. Yeah, speaking of frame rates, this one can actually shoot different slow-mo uh, at actually usable qualities. So what are the different frame rates that are possible on this? Because the old one, you could do real time, and that was about it for anything usable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the old one, you could shoot 24 frames per second. Uh, actually, you could shoot up to 40 frames per second at 5K. So the sensor's already windowed a little bit, and you can get up to 40 FPS with that. 5K resolution. This camera, again, same sensor, um, just a much more powerful computer in it. So this camera can shoot up to 82 frames per second in full sensor 6K and up to 100 frames per second in widescreen 6K. Um, and so that was the biggest reason for us to change cameras out, even though it was the same image quality technically, um, is having that full sensor size and those high frame rates because we shoot a lot of slow motion for our projects. Mm -hmm. um, this is also a DSMC2 camera, so it's compatible with a lot of the newer, um, newer accessories and newer third party modules and stuff. Because um, the whole thing with RED is its modularity and with the DSMC1, it was really hard to find parts for it and build it out, but this can be built out and kitted out with all the new stuff, which makes it really easy and awesome. If a little expensive, but it means you can actually find the stuff for the most part. It is a red. Uh, they are not as industry like common, I guess, as like the Sony's. So they are still hard to find. It's still hard to find stuff for these, but it's almost impossible to find DSMC-1 parts and DSMC-1 accessories, but it's a lot easier to find DSMC-2 accessories. Yes, and they are more expensive because it's the current, you know, high-end red um, system that they're on. So the, that stuff, even though they're easier to find, they're also in higher demand and the prices are higher because they're not as old. So DSMC-1 parts are all six years old plus at this point. Um, and also, the people we work with are on DSMC-2s. We don't work with anyone on DSMC-1s, so sharing stuff and swapping stuff and having to borrow the different modules of the reds, or swapping brains even, uh, the people we work with all have DSMC-2s, not DSMC-1s. 
and that just makes it way easier to work with them. So, you know, like all of the different parts transfer over really nicely. Mm -hmm. Another big thing that this has over the DSMC one is the bigger logo so that people know you're pro. <laughs> oh yes. And not gonna lie, having the fans on top, um, could you actually show them real quick? Mm -hmm. So the DSMC ones have the fan in the front where that logo is. Um, DSMC two has the fans on top and it still vents out the bottom and the back like it did on the DSMC ones, but this just makes it quieter. The audio guy likes you a little bit more <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just easier to handle that way, um, quieter on set and stuff like that. So that's just a nice little thing, not a deal breaker for us, but that's just a nice touch that they did. Mm -hmm. And jokes aside, having a better looking camera does help a little bit because it looks a little bit more professional. People are wowed by this and they want to hire you more. This camera, you walk up with that, it looks cool, it looks okay, but no one's gonna like, like do a double take on this camera. It's not a head turner. This one is. This one, people will be very excited about this camera or scared if you're just out and about, but they'll be excited about this one because they're like, that's a serious camera. The carbon fiber looks cool. The size, just the dimensions and just the shape of it being the shape of a cinema camera. It just looks different. It's a serious camera right here. Mm -hmm. And a nice thing, so this is not unique to DSMC2 or this camera by any means, but one thing that is really, really nice is this um, interchangeable lens mount on the front. So you can actually pop it off and here we have a PL mount right there. So, I mean, they're expensive, but that's, you know, just one extra thing that's really nice about these cinema cameras is you can just swap the lens mount. So right here I have this Sigma 18 to 35 lens in um, Canon EF, but if we have a PL lens that needs to go on the camera for a specific shoot, then we can just pop that mount on and it just fits right on there. So that's nice. Um, and then something unique to REDS as far as I know is the OLPFs, so the optical low pass filters. They are usually built into the front of the sensor. Um, however, on REDS, they're actually interchangeable. So they have different OLPFs that are optimized for different shooting situations. So Weston right here is holding up the skin tone and highlight OLPF. So this one is optimized for highlight detail retention and accurate skin tones. And then in the camera right now, we actually have the low light optimized OLPF. So it helps cut down noise and improve shadow detail when you're shooting in darker situations. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that we've got on this camera is we have a touch screen. So on the old camera, the old DSMC one we got, we were just using a cheap uh, cheap monitor on there that we just used HDMI for to plug it in. This one, no cables, it just plugs right into the top, it screws into the top and then it uses its gold contact points to communicate and send the video feed and then you can use the touch screen to control the camera settings. Makes things so much easier than on the old one just having to use this dial and the buttons. That was pretty tr tricky to to like be able to quickly change settings, but this one you can just hit the stuff and it's super easy and super quick. Mm -hmm. And I guess building off of that, um, you know, some people in the comments will probably be saying, well, yeah, but DSMC-1 is also modular. And that's true. DSMC-1 was also quite modular. I mean, that's been Red's thing basically mm -hmm. since the beginning. Yeah, a However, lot more modular than the Red 1. Yeah. However, um, that modularity on the DSMC-1 came at the expense of usually needing cables for that. So like their monitors needed a cable that plugged into the uh, SSD module and you know, just little things like that that make DSMC2 nicer to use. Mm -hmm. And like we said, the uh, modularity of the DSMC1 was tricky just for the fact that it was hard to find the modules in the first place. Uh, yes. Yeah, they were cheaper, but they were a, a lot more rare. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and then, so these cameras, they shoot in RAW and especially Red Code RAW. That was a big selling point for us to get into the ecosystem in the first place. Um, so I personally really like the Red Code workflow. I've worked with some other codecs like B-RAW and, you know, like obviously Sony's codex as well, but um, Red Code is just a different experience and I personally, it's my favorite codec that I've ever used so far. It's pretty quick and pretty easy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, however, it takes up a lot of space. So you can drop the compression. Uh, this camera, I believe you can go from one to two compression all the way down to one to 22. 
Um, and so we're usually shooting in the seven to one, eight to one compression range. But even then, um, it takes up a ridiculous amount of storage. So we've actually opted not to get a red mini mag. Um, we have opted to get the um, Kipper Tie long take, uh, two terabytes. And so this one per gigabyte is vastly cheaper. Um, it's like a third the price of Red Mini Mag. So this is still a very, very expensive two terabyte SSD. Don't get me wrong. But compared to the pricing of Red's Mini Mags, this made the most sense. And this being two terabytes, it gives us hours of recording time. Um, not that many hours, unfortunately, but um, it gives us several hours, you know, so if we're out in the backcountry, we don't have to worry about bringing along drives to dump footage to with mm -hmm. a 480 gig red mag. You know, we just use this and then we don't have to dump footage for the entire trip. Yeah, the red mags are so much more expensive and yeah, they're, they're just... They're just really expensive for how much storage you're getting when basically it's just an SSD in an enclosure. So this long take, uh, pretty expensive, but it's really, really fast and really, really good and definitely a good purchase, way better than the Red Mag. Mm -hmm. And if you guys do want to see like a separate review on this um, long take drive, since, I mean, I haven't been able to find very much info on it, so I was just kind of flying blind when I when uh -huh. I bought one, but if you wanna see a dedicated review to this, um, we can make that, but long story, very short, it works great and we've never had a problem, and mm -hmm. we love it, so very fast. Yeah, <laughs> and really, really quick, I love this thing, because you can plug USB-C into it to offload, you do not need another part which is the SSD reader. So if you're getting the SSD, either the Red Mag or the Kipper Tai Long Take, when you're getting a Red Mag, you also have to get a Red Mag reader. So if you're getting a 512 gigabyte or a one terabyte Red Mag and the reader, that's gonna probably end up being more expensive than just getting this two terabyte uh, Long Take. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we should go ahead and break that down and then show them all the different pieces that go into it. What do you think? The camera itself or yeah, the... Yeah, I think we should just tear it down right to the bottom. Okay. What are your thoughts? Yeah? Yeah, so we'll shut it down and grab the tools. Perfect. Let's do this. So what we've got here is we've got the top handle. Super useful for holding the camera like this and getting those shots. Uh, We've also been looking into getting a side handle, possibly. Uh, we're not getting that right now, because, like, you know, most cameras have a side handle, like the Sonys and stuff. But right now, we're running with the top handle. Okay, um, let's take the, uh, let's take the lens off next. So this lens here is the Sigma. 18 to 35. It's really, really good. Now, when shooting on Super 35, uh, you've got to take the lens hood off if you want to shoot all the way wide open at 18 to 20, in the 18 to 20 range, because there's a little bit of vignetting from the, uh, from the lens hood, and there's also a little tiny bit of vignetting at 18 when you're indoors, so usable range is maybe like 19 to 20 millimeters, and then on. It's because, it's because this is an APS-C lens. Uh, APS-C lens and APS-C sensor is slightly uh, slightly less wide than a Super 35. So this is a super good sharp lens with all internal everything. So keeping it balanced on the glide cam is a lot easier. And then we've also got the V-Lock battery. We've got the red monitor, 4.7 inch. Yeah, so... 4.7 inch touch monitor. Mm -hmm. There were two reasons that I opted for the 4.7 inch when I bought this camera. Um, first one was price. This one, I was actually able to get a pretty good deal on it. I paid about $800 for this stupid little monitor here. Um, but the 7 inch ones range like used maybe $2,400. And then the mm -hmm. ultra brights are 3000 and up. From, from there. Yeah, I think 3000 for a monitor is a little steep, but... Just a little. But you got this for 600 800 800 Yeah, that's actually a pretty good deal because you're getting no cables, you're getting integration, and you're getting touchscreen. Like a small HD monitor, similar in price, 
but you're not getting the integration. So definitely, if you can get the the 4.7 inch red touch monitor, it's a good monitor and uh, it's not that bad for the price if you can get a good deal on it, but don't get us wrong, it is still a little bit expensive as monitors go, but mm -hmm. you know, it gets the job done and it does it well. There's the Manfrotto base plate. Okay, and then this is the um, wooden camera battery plate on here. Um, and then this just has like these, you know, finger screws. So you just finger tighten that uh, and it's good to go, which is nice. You don't have to screw stuff in and out of the uh, body every single time. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have said don't use the wooden camera battery plate. Like it'll destroy the camera. Like you have to use the... Yeah. I was tightening that down and I sure was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, you have to use Red's uh, OEM battery plate stuff, but we have never had an issue with the wooden camera one. It has been doing just fine. I mean, yeah. I mean, this one works great. Yeah, it's got some plastic on there, but it also, everything that connects is metal, like the V-lock mount and the back plate, it's all metal. So you're not gonna break anything, just this filler. Just all this filler stuff is all plastic to save on weight, I assume. So that's pretty good, high quality, and it gets the job done. Yep. And then there is the brain. I'm not gonna take the lens mount off, um, but you know, the lens mount is just four screws right here. Boom, 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 boom. And um, so this will just, whole thing will just pop right off. And then the OLPF is what you're seeing in there. Here, let me get a nice reflection on there. There we go. Um, and so in there is just one little screw. You turn that screw and then the OLPF will pop out and you can slot a new one in and the camera automatically recognizes which OLPF is installed and adjusts your color profile accordingly, which is nice. Yep, it's got little contact pins on the back and yep, there's uh, what the OLPF looks like when it's out of the camera. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, these are all of the components that we have in this current handheld rig. Um, and then like, you know, there's a lot of accessories that we don't have just because they're expensive and we don't need them yet. So like the base or V-lock expander that goes on here adds all of your IO that most people will need. Um, they make bigger modules for productions that have XLR and stuff, but you know, like the base expander, we'll get one eventually, but for now our productions just don't need it most of the time. Um, and so that'll add like HDMI, SDI, audio in and out, um, stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. Biggest thing will probably be the SDI out for wireless mm. monitoring. Yeah. Um. And then next, as you saw in the beginning of the video, the Glidecam HD 4000. This is one of the bigger glide cams, which is good, perfect for the red. And it's a really, really nice uh, piece of gear, but it's ridiculously heavy with the red on it, so when you're trying to hold it, it's you know, like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Parker Walbeck uses a setup like this with his red, but he actually has muscles, so he can do it. We don't, so we have to use this. A vest! It's quite big. But yeah, that's the thing that straps to the person. And then you got an arm there too, don't you? Yes, there's the thing. So all these springs are like counter, counter pulling on different pieces of metal. I don't know how it all works, but somehow, somehow these springs do something, and you put the gimbal or glide cam, put it up in here, and it just sits. The handle sits on there, and uh, the arm, the arm holds all that weight for you. So it's like mounted here. And then you can still hold here and you can still hold the glide cam and like pinch it and do all the glide camming things that you gotta do. But this just takes that weight off and it just helps you. It also acts as a Z axis gimbal. Uh, it's not doing super well right now. We're gonna put some tri flow in all of the joints because it's a little sticky. You can hear it kind of has a bit of a squeak to it. So we'll tri flow all the joints and then the Z axis gimbal action should also be really good once we do that. So this is a pretty good piece of kit for how much? Um, that one was $300 for the arm and the vest, which is way cheaper than a lot of the alternatives. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot cheaper than the RE Trinity. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and then how much did you get the Glidecam 4000 for? Um, 
I paid about half of the going price for used Glide Cam HD 4000s. Um, so I think a lot of them were going for like 250, heavily used, and I bought that one for $130. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, that was like an eBay. That was uh, a late night eBay find. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was a really good deal on that thing. So yeah, just keep your eyes open. These things are pretty awesome. For our Sony's, we still use gimbals, uh, but for the red, this does a really good job. And we can make reviews as well on all of this stuff if you want. Like we can make a short review on the features of the monitor if you wanna really see the monitor and get, get more details on the monitor. Battery plate, SSD lens, lens mounts, OLPFs. We'll be making an OLPF uh, comparison video comparis com comparing the different OLPFs and how well they do in low light with skin tones, colors, and all that stuff. We can review the glide cam, we can review the arm, we can review all the stuff in separate videos and go into more detail, but this was a quick overview of the entire camera and just the kit and gear we've got for it right now. And to mm -hmm. kind of explain why we haven't made any videos lately, because <laughs> it's been all, like four months since we got the first red, and that one's long gone, sold that off. I made, sold that like three months ago. Yeah, you made a profit on it though, and I did, that it was, was just pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, because we kitted it out a little bit and shot a little bit of stuff. Here's a couple of clips that we shot on the first one. It does look pretty good. It's got some good dynamic range. It does have that red look. It does look nice. And yeah, it just doesn't have all the features that we needed. And there's just like all the stuff we talked about in the video. Mm -hmm. And then here, for example, is some slow motion. You couldn't do that on the old camera, but here's some slow motion that we shot on this camera. And it actually looks pretty good. It actually looks amazing because it's a red. Of course it yeah, looks I'm good. Yeah, pretty good. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is like, this is top notch. This yes. is cinema right here. It looks really, really good. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's the, uh, that's the basics of this camera and like the, um, the breakdown of the build that we have going on right now. Um, if you guys want to see more like specific stuff for like actually shooting on the red and compression ratio comparisons and installing LUTs or something or how to do a firmware upgrade, things like that. Um, you can just let us know uh, in the comments and we'll be, we'll be happy to make it. Yeah, so. just make sure you subscribe so that you can see these videos. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, make sure you subscribe to Chance Olson. He's got all the technical stuff. He's doing, doing all the technical red stuff. And then if you mm. want to see some of the films and productions we work on, make sure you subscribe to me, subscribe to West and I. Yeah. And I'll also, also, I'll leave a link to my business's YouTube yeah. page as well down in the description so that you can check out some of the like full on videos that we produced with this camera and our Sony's and whatnot. Yeah, go down to the description. There will be links, uh, all the stuff you can follow to see all the things that are going on down there. And also make sure you follow our Instagram accounts right down there. Ooh, uh, you know how to do that? That's pretty cool. Look at that. Cinema. <laughs> anyway, follow those. Uh, and then you can see photos and videos and updates and uh, communicate with us via DMs if you want to see our stories, all sorts of good stuff. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you next time. We should make a video for Inspire. Inspire? Oh yeah. Ooh. <laughs>